sermon outline is in your outline. You can grab that as we're looking at the Bible today. We're in a kind of an apologetic sermon series looking at um, different questions that people have in the world around us. When I was growing up on the farm um, up by Frankenmuth, at the end of supper time, it's usually always supper time, mom would grab a devotional book, dad would grab the Bible, or they would grab a different one. And after we were done eating, one would read um, from the Bible and one would read a devotion that was based on that scripture text. As I got older, you know, they would switch. We as kids would take our turns and, and we would read the Bible and we'd have a devotion together as a family at the dining room table. This was a little table in our kitchen. And the five of us would be around the table and we would hear from the Word of God. And I've got to confess, there are sometimes during those devotions my mind drifted. I'll just be honest with you. I would think about taking the BB gun out and shooting at things. I would think about the chores that I'd have to do that I did not want to do that afternoon. Not every devotion that we had at the table I listened to, but over the years I grew to really appreciate the Word of God. I saw a commitment in my parents' life that, that impacted me. And I understood over time that the Bible was unique and powerful. It was beautiful and it was rich. And it was the foundation upon which our family was built. It was important to me. The Bible was. And so today we ask the question, is the Bible true? I believe that the Bible is true. I'm just going to be honest with you. I believe that this is God's word, that it is inerrant, that God has spoken it through the apostles and the prophets before them so that we could understand the mind and the heart of God. And you may not be there yet. You might have questions. You might have doubts about the Bible. That is okay. Know that that is okay. We are on a journey together, but I pray that you come to the time when you have a confidence and a certainty upon the Word of God. And I pray that the Holy Spirit uses me today to maybe move you along on this journey a little bit, that the Bible is a beautiful, powerful Word from God to us. And so you might have questions. All of us at times have questions in life, and that is okay. But even if you have questions, you have to admit that the Bible is unique. All people who, who are thoughtful about the Bible recognize, all people recognize that the Bible is incredibly unique compared to other books. The Bible is unique in its composition. It is written over a span of 1,600 years by 40 different authors. There are not that many books that have 40 different authors all speaking about the same thing. What God would do for a broken creation. And that rings out from Genesis to Revelation. And these 40 different authors over a span of 1,500 years shows us that the Bible is unique in its composition. It is also unique in its circulation. It has been shared around the world. It has probably been the best-selling book for two, three hundred years. It has permeated the world in which we live in. And Jordan Peterson makes an interesting secular argument for the, the incredible uniqueness of the Bible because he says it is the foundation of all of our other truths in this world. That the Bible is foundational to understand other truths. And so the Bible is unique in its composition, it's unique in its circulation, and it's unique in its translation. It has been translated into so many different languages. It is the most translated book in the world. And where the Bible has not been yet translated into a language, there is a group of people probably working on translating the Bible into that language. It is unique in its translation. It is unique in its durability. There have been bans, there have been threats, there have been cults that have tried to warp the Word of God. And yet the Bible continues on. The Bible is still durable and faithful and strong. 
Kings and communists have tried to outlaw the Bible. And where there have been laws to outlaw the Bible, there have been people risking their very lives to share the Bible, to make sure that the people in those nations have the Word of God. And the Bible is also unique on its effect on people. I don't know about you, usually when I read a book and I get done with it, I put it on my shelf and I, I don't open it again. Occasionally, if I'm dealing with a subject that's related to that, I'll open up the book and I'll, I'll look at what I highlighted, circled, and starred in the book. Most people, they read a book and then it's done. But when it comes to the Bible, people who love the Bible, they finish the Bible and they start all over again. They finish it the second time and they start all over again. They, they know that if they read it five, six, seven times, they're just barely tipping their toe into the wisdom of God's truth. And the Bible is something that you never grow tired of. And it changes people. It has an effect on people's lives had a friend who was a chaplain, a chaplain in um, a, a jail. And I asked him once, I said, okay, um, why are you a chaplain in this jail? He goes, I, I used to once be here. And I thought, oh, you were a security guard? You worked here? He goes, no, I got it for free. I just stayed here for free. And he shared with me his story about how his life was totally messed up at one point, and then at a later point, as he was sitting in that jail cell, in that same jail, he received a Bible from the Gideons. He read that Bible, and his life was drastically changed. The Word of God affected him. And so the Bible is incredibly unique in all of those different ways. And you might agree, if you've got questions or doubts about, about the Bible, you might say, yeah, I understand that the Bible is unique. But there's a bigger question. Is the Bible true? Is it true? Is it accurate? Is it faithful? And that's the question before us today. And there's some tests I want us to look at. And I, I pray that you fill in the sermon outline, you consider this, and you wrestle with this. And yet you keep this outline for the time you come in contact with somebody who says, the Bible is full of errors. The Bible passes the manuscript test. You need to understand that the Bible passes the manuscript te test. When you were in high school or in college, you probably read something from Plato and Aristotle. Plato, Plato and Aristotle are these giants of philosophers of antiquity who have impacted Western civilization in a deep way. And so when you're in college or in high school and you read Plato or Aristotle, there probably wasn't anybody who said, oh, Plato, did he really write this? Oh, this isn't true. This is just his idea. This is just a myth or a fable. No one has probably said that. Because you understand something about Plato and Aristotle, that they were historical figures a long, long time ago. Now, for Plato, you see that he lived from 427 to 347, and the earliest manuscripts that we have do not date all the way back there. The oldest manuscript we have of a writing of Plato dates to around 900 AD. So that is a gap of about 1,200 years. Now, do you remember playing the game Telephone? You know, someone says something to somebody, that person repeats it to the next person, that person repeats it to the next, and it goes on. And the longer, the more people you have in there, the more messed up the message was, right? Sometimes if you've got somebody who can't remember anything, it only takes like two or three people. Um, oh. And so when you have a big gap, from when it was written to when the oldest manuscripts is, it's like playing that game telephone. And you can see here that the gap is 1,200 years. And we only have seven copies of those ancient writings of Plato to kind of compare them against one another. You can see Herodotus. Herodotus is one of the great historians. 
You can see that the gap between when he lived and wrote and when we have the oldest document is 1,300 years. And we have eight of those. You can see Caesar, Aristotle. Now we get to the New Testament. The New Testament was written between 50 and 100 A.D. And our oldest document, we don't have the originals, the oldest document we have is from around 130 A.D. So it's about anywhere from 30 to 80 years. So which one's better, the New Testament or Plato? Which one's better? If a long gap means a whole lot of people who can mess it up and a short gap means fewer people, which one's better, the New Testament or Plato? The New Testament. Because the gap is short. There's only like one person between the one is given and the final one. It is incredibly short. And the New Testament passes this manuscript test because there's 5,600 at least. Some people say we have 14,000 ancient manuscripts that we can lay on top of each other and compare them to. See, the Bible passes the manuscript test. Because the manuscript evidence for the Bible is unlike any other ancient book in antiquity. And then you you, you say, well, Pastor Craig, that's about the New Testament. What about the Old Testament? The incredible thing about the Old Testament is people will say, well, the, the Old Testament was corrupted by the Jewish people or by the Roman Catholic Church. And then in the in the 20th century, we found some scrolls along the Dead Sea. That predates the time of Jesus. And these Old Testament scrolls show us the the Old Testament before the Catholic Church and before the the Jewish tradition of Jesus' time. And the Old Testament, the Dead Sea Scrolls, is the same as what we have. See, the Bible passes the manuscript test. The Bible also passes the archaeology and historicity test. Is the Bible, this asks the question, is the Bible true? Is the Bible correct? Now, you can see the name of a people group, the Hittites. The Hittites were a group of people during the time of Moses. They're mentioned a lot after the children of Israel come into there. And the Hittites are mentioned often in the Bible. But there was a time where there was no archaeological or no historical evidence for the Hittites. And people used to mock the Bible. See, the Bible's wrong. There was no people called the Hittites. Until in 1906, over 100 years ago, they discovered, they discovered writings that confirmed that there was a nation called the Hittites. And then they discovered the capital of the Hittites. And then, like the Bible talks about, they discovered 40 different cities where the Hittites lived. And so in 1906, archaeology confirmed what the Bible teaches. You can see in Daniel chapter 5, it talks about a guy called Belshazzar. Now it says that in Daniel chapter 5, it says that Belshazzar was the king of Babylon. And the historians used to mock and say, oh, there was, there's no evidence for the king called Belshazzar to be king. Until in 1956, archaeologists came across three stones that talked about the king of Babylon leaving his country, and he placed his son in control as king. Anyone want to guess what his name was? Belshazzar. And those three tablets verified what we know in the Bible as true, that there was a king by the name of Belshazzar, that in Daniel chapter 5, Daniel references. And this is true about Pilate. This is even true about King David. Archaeological and historical evidence bears out that what the Bible teaches is true. Jewish archaeologist Nelson Bluck said, there has been no archaeological discovery that has ever contradicted a biblical reference. What does that mean? Everything in the Bible is historically verified? No, there are, some, there are some things, but the school of archaeology is still in session. 
And I believe that as archaeologists and historians find more things, that those gaps that we don't have historical evidence for are going to align with what the Bible teaches. Because that is what has happened over and over and over again. And when you get to Psalm 22, it's interesting in Psalm 22, King David is talking about himself in one sense, and he's also talking about the Messiah. And it says that when the Messiah comes, that when the king comes, he, he will suffer by being pierced in his hand and in his feet. In so many words, he's saying he will die by being pierced in his hands and his feet. And the setting for that, where, where the Messiah will suffer, the setting will be when there's mockers all around him. Sounds a lot like crucifixion. But the interesting thing about David, when he wrote Psalm 22, is that crucifixion had not yet been invented yet. It would be another 400 to 800 years before either the the Persians invented it and the Romans perfected it, or the Romans invented crucifixion when that would be a common practice of killing people. And yet, 400 years before crucifixion is invented, David says that the Messiah, in a group of mockers, will have his hands and his feet pierced. Now, how did David know about crucifixion before it was even invented? This shows us the the miracle of God, that God inspired his prophets and his apostles what to speak what to write. How did David know that the Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced? Because the Holy Spirit was teaching him. Sometimes people will say to me, Craig, you can't believe all those miracles in the Bible, can you? And I say, yes, I can. Because remember, last week we looked at God, and God exists outside of this universe. He is not dependent upon anything, and he is not breaking down. He is outside of the universe, and he is strong, and he is powerful, and he is independent. And so for God to do miracles, that's that's just what God does, because he's God. That's what he does before he eats breakfast. That's his recreational activity, is doing things that are strong, powerful, and independent of the laws that contain our universe. And so the Bible foretells what would happen. It passes the miracle and the prophecy test. How did David know what the future was going to hold? Because the Holy Spirit did a miracle and a prophecy was made. And those miracles are recorded over and over again when they took place. And so if people didn't, if they said, no, I saw Jesus. He didn't walk on the water. He was swimming in the water. They could argue against it. And they were written as they were taking place. You see some of the other prophecies here in the, in the Bible. Isaiah 7, Hosea 11, Psalm 22 we talked about, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is an amazing 700 years. How did Isaiah know that the Messiah would suffer like this? Because it was a miracle, it was a prophecy. And over and over again, Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies that talked about his first coming into the world. He fulfilled them. And so I can believe miracles because the miracle of prophecies took place. In Daniel chapter 7 and 8, it's interesting. A huge prophecy that the nation of Babylon would be defeated by the Persians. The Persians would be defeated by the Greeks. And the Greeks would be defeated by an empire to the west of them. (laughs) If you know anything about history, Daniel 7 and 8, written 500 years before Jesus, predicts the Persians really close, Alexander the Great, and then the Romans. For our God, miracles do not make him even break a sweat. And then the Bible is accurate about me. It passes the personal reality test. Who am I? God knows who I am better than I know who I am myself. 
And who are you? God knows who you are. He knows who you are. And I wish God was not so accurate about describing me in the Bible. <laughs> I wish he wasn't so accurate. I met a man once. He, he wanted to argue about the Bible. He didn't want the Bible to be an authority in his life. And so he argued against the Bible. And then he disappeared. I didn't see him for many years. And then later he came back to me and said, Craig, you know why I had to argue against the Bible? Because I know that I was doing things that were contrary to the Bible. And I either had to change or I had to show that the Bible was false. And it was easier for me to attack the Bible than to change. The Bible knows who we are. Look at what it says in Romans. So I find this law at work. Although I, I want to do good, evil is right there with me. You ever want to do good and not do it? The Bible says, I know. Jeremiah, the heart, that which is inside of us, is deceitful among all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah says, man, there's a problem in me. I rebel. I'm arrogant. I'm, I'm petty. I hold grudges. And I don't understand why I do this. Ezekiel, I love Ezekiel 36. Can you read that with me? Let's read it together. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Circle the words, I will, I will, I will. See, this is the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is God will do something for us. You might think that the message of the Bible is to, to be a good person. We're way beyond that. There is no hope of that. The hope that we have is that God will do something. That he will give us a new heart. That he will put something within us. That he will remove our trespasses as far as the east is from the west. And give us a heart that is alive. The message of the Bible is we need a Savior. And that's what we hear over and over again in the Scriptures. The Bible passes the personal reality test. And so does the Bible pass. The Bible also passes the Jesus test. It passes the Jesus test. In Matthew 4, we heard it earlier from Pastor Thomas, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus loved the Old Testament. He knew it, he read it, he marked it, he learned it, he inwardly digested the, the Old Testament. He loved it. And he declares, this is the word of God. This is the truth of God. And so, because the Bible is the word of God, let us be in the word. A couple months ago, I think it was, Pastor Thomas talked about, hey, for this week, take with you. Remember what he said to take with you wherever you go? Take your Bible. It was a great, great reminder Let's, let's take the Word of God with us. Let's read the Word of God. When you have a, a dull moment, open up and let's take in. If this is the Word of God, and it is, shouldn't we know what God is saying to us? If This is the Word of God. This is the promise of God. This is the, the life-giving Spirit of God. And so let us be in the Word. If you have never read the Bible, I would encourage you to read the book of John and then the book of Acts and then come see me or talk to Pastor Thomas. Just read John, read Acts, come up with some questions and let's sit down and talk. 
And if you've read the Bible before, I encourage you, in the back there are some outlines. We are reading through the top 365 chapters of the Bible this year. And I encourage you, whether it's on your own, to just read one chapter a day if you don't have your own reading plan. But I encourage you to grab one of those sheets and read one chapter a day. And then if, if dialoguing with other brothers and sisters would be helpful, we will set up more tables. We were full today in the gathering room. We'll set up some more tables. We'll put them in, in theater seating if we have to because we want to be in the Word of God, because it is the Word of God. It is the truth of God. It is the life-giving Spirit of God. Is the Bible true? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I believe it is true, and it is for you and for me. And the Word of God changes everything. It gives us hope, and it gives us a heart that is alive in faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking. Slow us down to be willing to listen. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.